<sighs> okay, um, this is an explanation of chapter 7.4, which is the normal approximation to the binomial. And um, certainly 50 years ago, and even up till when I was taking these classes, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, um, approximating was really an important concept because calculating things exactly was very time consuming and very hard. And you could imagine if you didn't have a computer, being able to do a quick approximation that was close, even if it wasn't perfectly accurate, was really, really important. Now, that's still true, and we still do that in lots of cases. In the particular example of the normal approximation of the binomial, computers are fast enough, and with even with a spreadsheet like we're going to do here in this class, um, you don't really need to do um, these approximations all that often. And so, um, we're going to cover it here because it's really nice in that it brings all the pieces of this second part of the course together. Um, this idea about normal distribution, the discrete distributions and the binomial, and the fact that the normal and the binomial are actually connected um, is kind of a cool idea. But again, um, not all that long ago, it was a thing you actually did to solve problems. And now um, we're going to have computers do all of that for us. So. Um, let me just remind you of uh, the story of craps that we talked about before. Um, and you might remember that you rolled two dice and a whole bunch of things can happen. And I'm not here to explain how craps works because uh, you know gambling um, is maybe a thing you wanna do down the road, but me teaching you how to do it is probably not um, what this class is about. Um, but on the first roll of craps, if you can roll an 11 or a seven, that's really good and you win uh, that round of the game. So rolling a seven or 11 is a pass um, or a craps. And like I said, in the game of craps, that's a good uh, thing for you to have happen. And we worked out the probabilities for this um, a couple times ago. And the probability of getting a craps in one roll of two dice was uh, eight out of 36. And remember, we worked that out before, and it's about 22%. And um, we could then build on that to the binomial distribution. So here I just drew out um, if we did craps, if we rolled the dice uh, 15 times, how many successes could we expect? What's the probability of getting a certain number of successes? So if I said, what's the probability on 15 rolls, we would get three, uh, seven or 11s. It happens about a quarter of the time and uh, about 24 and a half percent. And that's cool. We could actually make a chart of this and actually in the homework before you kind of did that, you made a little probability uh, histogram as you did that. And I made one here for this. And um, what you see is, you know, the rectangles go up and back down. And it doesn't take too much imagination to say, hey, doesn't that kind of look like um, a normal distribution? And, you know, we could imagine going zoom and zoom. And again, I'm a drawer, horrible drawer, especially on the computer. But that idea that um, we could have, uh, you know, approximations with a normal that get pretty close um, aren't that uh, hard to imagine. And again, um, it's actually about 300 years ago, it was in uh, seventh, early 1700s, that they first noticed that the binomial distribution had this nice property. Now, one of the things that we noticed is um, that, you know, these whole numbers is part of the problem. And actually, here's a graph I got from the internet. Um, but the idea that part of the problem is that you have a whole number here, which is a whole number, but we're really using uh, these shapes over here. So the problem with the approximation is that this isn't actually a perfect rectangle, but if you imagine it here, the little part here that's cut off, chunk, 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 and the little part of here that's not in, chunk, 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 those are about the same size. And again, they're not perfect, but that makes us think that this approximation will be pretty, pretty okay as we do it. Now, one thing that could help us is if we have a larger sample size, we could imagine that instead of having 15 dice rolls, we have 150 dice rolls. So here I recreated the chart, and again, it goes all the way down, and it doesn't matter. Um, but you can see that, um, you know, that wasn't very hard to do. I did it ahead of time, just because it takes a little bit of time to do all the dragging with the dollar sign and stuff. But, um, you know, the 22% stays the same, but now we have 150. When we look at that probability on the chart, um, again, it's hard to read because the lines are too close together you go, man, that kind of does look like a normal distribution. And if we could figure out when that happens and how that happens, then we could go ahead and do this approximation without fear. And it turns out that um, this approximation is actually pretty good 
pretty quickly. And so this idea that these rectangles and the part that's cut off here and the part that isn't included here, again, works out pretty close um, as we do that. So um, looking at our textbook, right, let me first remind you a binomial has um, n trials. So we're going to do the same thing multiple times. Each one of those has the same probability of success. There are two outcomes, one of which we've called a success and one of which we've called a failure. And the probability of a success is some amount p. Um, in that case, we just did it was 836, but it's whatever amount that you have. All right, and here's a little history note about the binomial approximation by uh, Dumas in 1733. So thanks, textbook, for giving us some history. So um, in the example here in the book, they're saying, well, what if we had to do that 500 times, right? Calculating that binomial probability 500 times would be super annoying. And again, we can do it in Excel without or spreadsheet without too much trouble, but doing this normal approximation would be even quicker. And the last part of it is how big of a sample size or what other conditions would we need in order for that approximation to be good. And the one that we're going to use is NP1 minus P is greater than or equal to 10. So the idea is if that condition is satisfied, then the probability is symmetric, it's bell-shaped, and we can approximate it by the normal distribution. And going back to my Excel sheet here from a little bit ago, uh, one of the things we see is that, you know, certainly 150 was more normal looking than um, 15. But the other thing we could see is that if instead of using um, 8 fifths, if we were looking at a, a success of 0.5, we would see that it actually looks better already. So the two different conditions are P is near 0.5 or the sample size is big. And so in our textbook, this idea that we can get both of those with that um, condition of NP1 minus P is greater than or equal to 10. Other textbooks use other numbers. Some use five. Some look at NP and NP1 and, and minus P separately. Um, but the main idea is that P is either near 0.5 or N is big are uh, kind of the conditions that we need. And again, it's an approximation. So the larger this number is, the better. So how big is big enough? Well, 10 is the number we're using here. But certainly, you know, more bigger would be more better as we do that. Okay, so the last part of this then is thinking about how to actually do this in practice. And the little thing we're going to do here is called the continuity correction. And this is that little thing I had the picture here a second ago, where we're looking at this idea that instead of thinking of eight as a point, we should really be thinking about seven and a half here and eight and a half here. And if we can do that, then we can get to um, the approximation that we want. For one thing, if we didn't do that, we couldn't look up any number on the normal curve because the probability of an exact number, remember, is zero. So what we're going to do is, if we're looking for a single number, we're going to look for plus a half and minus a half. So if I say, hey, what's the probability on 15 dice rolls? Um, we're going to get um, you know, exactly three. Well, we can't do three in a normal distribution. We're going to look at between two and a half and three and a half. So that idea of adding and subtracting 0.5. If we're just doing a one directional one, we're just going to do the plus five on the top. If we're doing the upper one, we're going to do the minus five on the bottom. And if we're looking for a range, we're going to do minus 0.5 on the bottom and plus 0.5 on the top. I never remember that. Instead, what I do is I scribble down a picture just like this one and I go, oh, if I mean eight, I should go from seven and a half to eight and a half from here to here. Okay, and we can do that for any number. If I say, what well, do we want to go from four to eight, we would go from three and a half, right? Because we want to get all of this area in here. And if we think back to our thick rectangles, they kind of do that for us automatically, right? That from three and a half, three and a half is where the rectangles get divided when you make a histogram, because you got to put the uh, dividing line somewhere as we do that. All right, so all of that is just a chance to say, this is how we're going to calculate it. So I'm going to stop the video and start it again. And when I do that, um, I'll show you how we're going to do this in, um, uh, in a spreadsheet as we do it.